time. <laughs> I mean, why not? I got it. Here. You'll need more next. I got it. Hey. Hey, now. <laughs> all right. All right, all right. Everybody doing okay? Oh, yeah. Okay. How are we doing? Anybody, uh, anybody practice fasting this week? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Cool. Yeah, good. Like, oh, pastor, did I just give away my blessing? No, you didn't. Um, listen to last week's message. You'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm opening up to Timothy. You guys can open up wherever you want. <laughs> it's all true. Which one? First. Yeah, Timothy wore out. Uh, Timothy, all wore out? One of my favorite books, man. I'd say that about all of them. Whenever you're studying them, you're like, what's your favorite book? The one I'm studying right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whichever one I'm working on right now. Oh, my gosh. All right. Man, let me have a look at you guys. All right. Good to see you. Hi, good morning. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Good to see you guys. All right. You ready to rock and roll? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. We're just going to keep on pressing through. You guys notice that it gets a little more jungly in here every time that you come. <laughs> so the, if you hadn't noticed, um, look around. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of cool. The idea is that uh, artistically we want to kind of, as we go deeper, we're kind of getting deeper. You know what I mean? So when we started, it was just kind of up here, and then it's been kind of migrating out yeah, there. And it's exciting for me because I never know what it's going to look like when I come in. Um, yeah. Then I come in on Sunday, and I'm like, oh, my God. Look at this. This is all. We're deep. We're in deep. <laughs> but this is part four. I'm going to go I'm gonna go seven here. We're talking about uh, the, the discipline, uh, the disciplines of, of Christianity, what we need to do to live a disciplined life and ultimately to live a victorious life. And if you want to live a life of victory as a Christian, this is the stuff you need. And I, I wish I would have known some of these things on, on day one, like on, on ground level. So uh, for those of us who have been Christians a long time, uh, it might be a little more work for us to add these into our lifestyles all of a sudden. Like, oh, I didn't realize that there were these disciplines and that I was supposed to be applying them to my life. And for those of us um, who are, are new to Christianity, uh, you guys kind of go, okay, well, this is, this is it. This is, you know, this will be your first impression, which is great. And I, I wish it was mine. Uh, because it really does jettison you uh, towards a, a, a lifestyle of victory. And so I just want to thank you guys. Last week was probably pretty tough for some of you guys. It's not always exciting to talk about not eating. We love to eat. Uh, but fasting is super, super important. Uh, right now you guys know we have a, a church-wide unbroken fast going on for our, our ladies at Unbox. Know that we, like we've been talking about it. We've been carrying that torch. And I think it's very, very very important. Guys, we're, we are making an investment in the women of our church. We're making an investment in our sisters and our daughters and our wife and, um, you know, what uh, the, yeah, and our, our church. You know, there, there are people on the, on the fasting group who uh, don't have uh, a wife or a daughter necessarily who are who are going to unbox, but they're fasting for you ladies anyways because you make up a, a, a part of this church, a major part of this church, and we need you to be strong. If you're strong, then we're strong, and and so uh, we want to really um, pray and pave that way for you. Uh, we know that there are untold things that are happening as we pray. Uh, I can tell you guys uh, firsthand. Pastor Tanya probably doesn't want me to share this, but I'm gonna so plug your ears. Um, but uh, you know, you ladies, you have it coming, right? Unbox is coming for you. And for those of ladies that have been there, you know, there's a lot of soul work, a lot of heart work, um, a lot of work between you and Christ uh, that, that kind of goes, it's not the stuff that we can show on the, on the screen. We want to keep that stuff private and sacred and holy. Uh, and, and we do that on purpose. And so what we get to see is you guys like having fun and being in the mountains and, you know, doing, doing fun things. But we know that there's hard work um, being done. And as uh, Pastor Tanya develops these messages, she actually goes through all those emotions first and before you guys. And so sometimes it catches me off guard. I'll be in my office, I'll walk in and, you know, Pastor T's like on edge, not like angry on edge, but like, you know, all of her emotions are just like here. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> be in the doghouse if you need me, okay? That's where that's where I'm headed. Um, I, have, I have a little garage. I call it a doghouse. So like that's, that's where I go. Um, 
but I don't go there because I'm mad or I want to distance myself from Pastor Tanya. I go there because I know she needs my prayer. And so I go into that place where I can just pray and, um, and, and uh, just seek God on her behalf. And so uh, very, very um, cool. Um, I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, it's an honor. It's a, it's a burden. It's lovely. It's uh, unique in every way. To be able to watch that from my side, to, to watch that going on. And so um, just want to thank you guys uh, who are fasting and praying uh, and echo what Robert said uh, when he came up here um, speaking uh, uh, as uh, a mouthpiece for the Lord that we need to pray for our pastors and that um, definitely includes Pastor Tanya because um, she is travailing for you, for you ladies and uh, you're going to be super, super blessed and so I'm really, really thankful. I think that message on fasting was timely. Uh, it was like a little shot in the arm for those of us who are who are fasting for in the house right now, like fasting for you ladies. Um, like, hey, okay, this is a discipline. We're on it and, you know, there's... A, I was just talking with Damon a little earlier before church started, and it was just like, um, you know, we were just talking about when you know what you're doing it for, when you, you've got this focus and this purpose, it, it doesn't make the sacrifice less stingy, um, but it, it does make it doable, right? Like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plow through this. I know what I'm doing it for, and I know that it has um, impact. And so I want to just thank you. Thank you guys for that. And so I think we all, I think it's safe to say we all want to lead successful lives, don't we? And we want to be successful Christians. I, I, I'm, yeah, put your church hats on. Like, I'm not just talking about like, oh, I want to be a, an entrepreneur and I want to have, uh, you know, eight or nine figures in my bank account and all these other things. Like, whatever the world deems as a success or whatever you think um, when you think about world, worldly success. I mean, successful Christian lives like Davina was talking about up here. You guys understand that tithing is not for your pastors. It's not for your church. It's not for God. God doesn't need your money. God's after your heart. And we know that your heart is connected to your wallet. And he knows if you can get to your wallet, you get to your heart. And that's really the point and the purpose, right? It's not about, um, you know, patting anybody's wallet or, um, or creating some, some false sense of uh, financial security. And we give because we have a heart for who God is. We want to break the curse that comes as a default over our lives. There is a curse over our lives. And if you're not systematic and you're not, uh, you don't understand why you're giving and what to give and how to give it, you might as well just keep your money because it's not doing what you think it's going to do, right? You're not, you're not like, ah, oh, I threw such and such in the plate for you, pastor. Well, first of all, it's super offensive. Don't say that. Um, because uh, that's it's not it's not for me it's not mine this is God's money I tithe too we're we're givers too um, so you know we do all the we do all the stuff that you guys do for the same same reason we want to break mammon uh, over our hearts and over our lives and we want to be uh, wealthy in true riches right Davina yes. and man when you get a hold of true riches oh. woo, and I'll tell you what the, those false Christians I didn't even want to talk about this but I'm the, yeah those those Christians who just say it yeah just like in, in living haphazard Christianity, when they see you enjoying true riches, it's infuriating to them. They're like, ah, oh, what are you, ah, oh, you know, it rises up in this mammon, you know, just rising up in them, getting all jelly and, you know, but they can have it too. They can have it too. You know what I mean? They just got to straighten up and fly right. That's exactly what, what uh, God told Cain. He's like, hey, I'll accept you too. I'll, I'll accept you too. Straighten up and fly right. You, you don't have to be offended, but I'm not going to do this your way. I'm not going to bend to your will, Cain. You're going to have to bend to mine. And Cain was like, nope, not going to do that. And we all know how that story ended. So um, we want to live, though, and in this day, in this age, we, we want to live successful Christian lives. You guys understand we have to, we, we live under with the knowledge that our lives are important, our day-to-day -day is important, whatever years we get on this planet are very, very important, but we also live knowing that there's an eternity waiting for us, and we live in victory in this day to enter into victory that day. Isn't that what the Lord said? From victory to victory, glory to glory, right? God wants to, to bring us from um, success to success. And, and 
That's why we want to celebrate. That's why I want to share testimony. That's why I want to talk about it. Because life is tough. It's difficult. There's a lot of trials. There's a lot of things that go on. It's not always fair. Uh, things can get pretty rotten out there. You, I don't have to tell you guys. We know that, right? Just by living in this real world, things get pretty tough out there. And so it's nice to have a place where we come in and be encouraged and hear how God's moving in the hearts and in the lives of other people and know that, man, if God's doing that for somebody else, he can do that for me too, okay? So... Um, Discipline is a good thing. Uh, in in First Timothy four seven, Paul says that we should we should uh, train ourselves to be godly. That means it doesn't come natural to be godly. We have to train ourselves to do it. it it's not like oh, I just I I go to church and so I'm a godly person and or I you know help my neighbor with their groceries. So, but we have to train ourselves um, to to be godly. And he goes on to say, and I, I thank him for this little nugget that physical training is of some value. So thanks, Paul. <laughs> like, like throw us that little nugget. But, um, but he said, really, your godliness is, is good for all things. It holds a promise. Someone say holds a promise. Holds a promise. It holds a promise. So your, your godliness holds a promise for the present life and the life to come. Do you see God cares about your present life? And he cares about the life to come. So we can't get too focused on either one, right? As, as mature, grown-up Christians, we have room in our minds and room in our hearts to navigate through both worlds and be thinking about both, both worlds, this life and the life to come. And there's a set of discipline that as believers and followers of Christ, we must adopt in order to pursue this godly living. Lives that have meaning, lives that have impact, lives that, that, that have influence on, on those who are around us. And that's really in, important. Uh, it's important as we move forward into the next set of disciplines, which I'm trying to stay on, on task here. But we need to uh, be this particular people, this peculiar people that God has called us to be. He said we're different. Right? You guys are you're different. And I know that sometimes when we're young or when we're self-conscious, like we want to be anything but different. Right. And, right. and even the kids that are trying to be different, they're trying to be different so they can be the same. Okay. Do you understand? But, but, we, but we are different. God has made us different. We're no longer of this world, but we're in this world. And so there's things that we have to participate in, things that we have to do, things that we don't really like, things that aren't really congruent with what's happening in the kingdom. But we understand that those are some of the things that we have to do while we're here. It's part of the desire in our hearts to, okay, let's graduate. Let's, let's get through that doorway. But in the meantime... Uh, we, we are to uh, be in this world, but, but not of it. And the Bible teaches that Christianity looks differently uh, because we're, we've been set apart from the world. So we look different from the world. We do things differently. We, we want to be sanctified by God for His purpose and His glory. And there's many things that we do as Christians that seem quite normal, right? Just like normal behavior, especially in our culture. We've, we're even as secular as the world has swung uh, as, as far over as that pendulum is, is now into this um, secular vein. We still have the benefit of, you know, 200 plus years, maybe even more, you know, before, you know, this country was actually um, made a country. You know, I'm sure there, were, there was, you know, we, there was that seed that was here uh, of, of godly living. And so we have all those roots. So it doesn't look, you know, maybe in a, in a, in a more uh, secular country, um, some of the, the normal things we do would look a little less normal. But my point is that there are, there are many things that, that are quite normal and the world would look at as quite normal. But there are also many things that we do that would seem abnormal. To the world okay. that would seem abnormal to uh, a a more secular society, even though they're they're quite normal to us. Committing to a lifestyle of submitting yourself to acts of spiritual discipline is exactly what I mean when I say that there's stuff that we do that seems a little abnormal to the outsider or even the casual Christian who might you know walk into a service like this and be like, what what is going on? Some of it makes perfect sense to the carnal minded. They go, oh, they're just, they're just trying to be good people, and we're trying to be good people, and so religion's a wash. They're really just, they need their God as a, as a pad, you know, or a, yeah, a crutch or a parachute, and, but we're all actually just trying to live good lives, and that's, 
that's not true, but I understand that that's how things can look. Sometimes they seem like totally normal, you know, and, and, and others, there, there's some things that we do that uh, even a, a casual Christian or, or an outsider completely would look in and say, wow, that's kind of cult-like behavior. That's, that looks cultish to me, which is like the oldest insult and the le least stingy insult in the book. So um, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. We preach freedom and Christ crucified. And, you know, like there's a... So anyways, um, so, but there, there are stuff that we do and we live by a moral code and then there's a group of people people that are all like adhering to this moral code for somebody from the outside looking in that can seem uh, they don't have an, a word to describe it so they you know might might describe it as something uh, cultish something that like oh that's that's a weird thing to do but we know that it's not a weird thing to do that it's quite normal yeah. you know we, we want to live lives that that are successful and in order to do that as Christians in order to be successful Christians we need to live this disciplined lifestyle that's what we've been talking about all these weeks and when you live by a certain moral code your right living, you guys need to understand this, just a little nugget. Um, your right living will cause people to feel judged even though you're not judging them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, and, and it isn't judgment. What they're, what they're feeling is conviction. And conviction's actually a good thing. That's when the Holy Spirit's knocking on their heart, right? Hey, like, hey, this is for you too. And so I just want you guys to, um, you know, carry that with you as you, as you go through your day to day, that there, there might be people in your circles and people in your life who um, maybe they even come at you, you know, like you're, you're being judgmental towards them, but you're not. You're just like, let me give you a really, really silly example. I remember um, when I was a... Uh, a young teen, I was at uh, this parade in Louisville, Colorado, and I was there with my friend, and one of our favorite uh, pizza places was there, so it was my brother, and so it was me and my brother and two, two of my friends, and we went into this pizza place, and we sat down, and um, we just, uh, we ordered some food, and it looked really good, but, like, I noticed that my hands were, like, super dirty, and I didn't, you know, I'm a teenager, I'm like, I don't know, I gotta wash my hands, whatever, so I just decided to use, like, a fork and a knife. So I'm like cutting my pizza, you know what I mean? And like eating it like nobody's business. And I like look up and my friend's like seething. He's like looking at me like so angry. Now mind, remember, we're just children, right? So he's like looking at me like so angry. And he like throws his hands down, folds his arms. Like, you think you're better than us? So you're eating pizza with a fork and a knife? Who do you think you are? Right? He's making this huge scene. I was, I was just like got my mouth full. I'm like, what, bro? Like just like, just eat it. <laughs> I know it's a really, really, really silly, silly example. But my point is this. You could be doing something so benign, like, like just like, hey, I'm just running my race. I'm just doing my thing. And then all of a sudden, somebody who was looking in, and you might even not have noticed was looking in, yeah. is like having a fit. Yeah. They're like yeah. seething. Like, oh, you think you're better? And I was like, no, I'm hungry, and I didn't want to wash my hands. <laughs> you know, like this perfectly clean fork in front of me. Like, I'll just... <laughs> Sadly, I, you know, like, I, after I, you know, I kind of blew him off a little bit, but then I just picked it up and ate it. So, like, I just... <laughs> like, he made such a scene about it. I don't, I don't know why. Exactly. So, yeah. So, anyways. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Like, why? Why are you looking? But it, yeah. understand, the world is looking. They're looking, right? Especially if you, they know you're a Christian, they're watching. They might not tell you that they're watching, but they're watching. They want to see how you handle life, what you're doing. And, you know, if they reason that, you know, you are exactly the same, same as them, you handle strife exactly the same, you handle stress exactly the same as them, you handle all the stuff, that, and you say you're going to heaven and they're going to hell, they're going to take a real problem. They're going to take an issue with that. So we, we do need to live uh, differently, right? We do need to live in a way um, that is, brings glory to our Father. And, and if somebody raises a little fit about it, then uh, we'll have an opportunity um, to talk with them, which is really, really good. And just understand this. How someone feels or what they think about how you're living is none of your business. Right. Okay, so just don't worry about it. Okay, just keep on, keep on living. All right. 
Let's pray. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus that you would speak to us this morning. God, we want to hear your heart. Uh, we want to know you better. Come on, am I the only one? God, we, we want to know you better. God, we, we want to uh, develop. Yeah, we, we want to um, grow into the people that you want us to be, God. We want to live uh, lives of victory as you define it. We want to live lives of success as, as you define it. And I trust that you help us to do that in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Okay, so there's 16, as you guys know, know there are 16 disciplines uh, at least 16 there there's probably a couple more in there I felt like I just kind of wanted to boil it down believe it or not this is boiled down uh, but I, tr I tried my I, I, I did tried my best here so um, they can be divided up into these two categories the disciplines of self-restraint and the disciplines of engagement so if you guys haven't been um, here the last few weeks make sure you go online and take advantage of that uh, that resource there always it's better to be here um, but if you have to if you have to be gone for whatever reason at least there's uh, there's that so Today we're going to keep on uh, plugging through this, this list. We've already learned about the disciplines of solitude and silence and frugality and fasting. We kind of just glossed over. I'm going to gloss over all of these guys um, because I, I want to give you, I want to leave you with the gift of discovery. I want you guys to have something to study and, th and think about during the week. And I'm going to do the same thing uh, today, which is why I kind of want to tackle so many. Every one of these is worth their own message or series of messages. And I had a really hard time doing that. And I was asking the Holy Spirit, I'm like, is this really what you want me to do? I mean, because this is like five years of work. If you, if you really want to, I mean, you think about it. We only get 52 Sundays in a, in a year. Yeah. And, and so you, how many series? They fill up fast, you guys. And, and um, you know, excited. it's exciting. But I was just like, okay, God, like, is this, is that what we're, we're going to be the discipline church? Like, is that what we're doing? You know, and so anyways, I'm just going to give you guys um, what, what uh, he gave me to give you. And then let you guys kind of. Uh, let, plant that seed and let you guys just try to develop that for yourselves in, in your own lives and just kind of see where it goes. And my hope is to inspire you to a faith that expresses itself through godly living. I want, I want you guys to ha have a, a living faith. And, and for those of us who, who walk in living faith, we understand what great victory there is in it and what, what great joy there is in it and what great re reward there is in it. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. But we also have to know, remember we talked about just... Um, being spiritually mature, recognizing that we live in this world and we're also living for eternity. There's more to it even still because we, we have to understand that it's, it's not our godly living that saves us. Okay, and it's very important, guys, if you don't hear me at anything else today, hear this. It's very important that you understand that your godly living does not save you. Okay, because it's, it would be very easy to turn all this good discipline into rotten religion. It's like you're one breath away from that happening. We walk that razor's edge yeah. every day. Every time we apply discipline to our lives, we are on the razor's edge. Is this honoring to God? Is this where my heart is? Or, or if I postured myself in a religious atmosphere and I'm just checking boxes? And, and to be honest, uh, even as you pursue discipline, Discipline, there will be days that you fall into the into the wrong category. There will be days and times, and that's okay, guys. It's okay to fall off of a bicycle. Okay? What's not okay is to throw your bike in the bush and be like, well, I'm never riding a bike again because I fell that one time. None, none of us ever did that, right? We skinned our knee. We cried. We got a Band-Aid, you know, a little back teen or whatever our moms put on, and we're like, ah! <laughs> Why? I'll be better next time. <laughs> Why the elbows too, man? It's always the elbows. Yeah. Mm. All right. Man. But here's the thing. We understand that godly living does not save us, right? It, it's... But here's the thing. Your godly living will certainly preserve you. It will most definitely cause you to live a victorious life. And it will also help to rack up treasure in heaven while you're here on earth. So we've got a lot of, re there's that and much, much more. There's, we have a lot of really good reasons, a lot of really good incentive to live godly lives here on this earth. But it is your faith in Jesus alone that saves you. And the, the moment you forget that is the moment you start walking in a religious way, in a way that's unpleasing to the Lord. And so today, I'm going to just round off this list of self-restraint by briefly discussing 
these last three, chastity, uh, secrecy, and sacrifice. And I, I believe that you guys are going to find that a disciplined life does take a great deal of intentionality. But it makes, it makes your day, I'm telling you, it makes your day, I don't know if fun is the right word, but it makes your days much more interesting. Like you wake up with purpose. Okay. And, you know, when sometimes you wake up, you're aimless and you don't have purpose. It's difficult. You'd be like, oh, I just want to stay in bed or I hate Mondays or whatever the thing is. But if you wake up and you've got purpose in your heart and you've got intentionality in your heart, you've got a day to live a life that's satisfying and pleasing to your God. And, um, you know, that might sound a little corny on the surface, but it actually um, it is uh, like the, the most um, inspirational, motivational thing that, that you can apply to your hearts in order to get through uh, your, your day-to-days, all right? So I, I think there's a, a richness that comes in serving Christ your King, and, and it makes the, the suffering totally worthwhile. It reminds me of the story um, that Jesus was talking about when, when he was uh, talking about women who give birth and, you know, through the, the pain and the pangs. I don't know, if, guys, if you've ever been in the room when your wife is, uh, was delivering, um, I don't... I don't know why you would ever do that, <laughs> having, having been there myself. <laughs> we're idiots for letting the medical community think that it was a good idea for us to be in the room. <laughs> With that, that is clearly women's business. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, walk in there, I'm like, this is not, what am I, yeah. what am I doing in here? Yeah. <laughs> and why is there no blood in my face? You know, I like literally felt all the, like, <laughs> all the blood drains in her face and I remember the doctors like hang, handing me this squiggly wet alien with a rope attached to it as like you want to cut that I'm like isn't there somebody more qualified this is like gonna cost us like 5,000 bucks like come on somebody in here that can cut those things <laughs> I cut it real long. I was like, I'll cut it, but I'm cutting it out here. Like, somebody's got to do it close, because I'm not. He's wiggling. Mm -hmm. Jeez, what were we talking about? That really threw me off. So, so Jesus said that, uh, so... The pain is crazy. Like I remember, like before, man. I, I could tell. I could take all morning and tell the story. I'm gonna. I'm gonna save you guys from that. But they have this little chart, and when this chart makes little mountains on it, and when the mountains like start to peak, that's when you know that your bride is in excruciating pain, right? And so you can kind of see them dip, and then they start to climb back up. And you look at the screen, which she can't see, and then you look over at her, like. Okay, screen says you're in pain, you know, and then as it start, passes a certain number, your hand starts to get a little sore because of the, like, okay, there it is. She's, do you know what I'm talking about? Did they have that, they have that thing for you guys too? It's crazy. It's just like mountain after mountain after mountain after mountain. I'll just, just push it out. Just think, this is just, let's, just, let's get the show on the road here. But all that pain, all that misery, I'm like, who could ever, who could ever do that, you know, and. Tanya almost died with Raiden. Uh, it was, I mean, it was she was on the on the edge there. So, um, man, but like as soon as the doctor put Raiden in her arms, she was like, "Oh, let's have another one." I'm like, "What? <laughs> you did not see things the way I just saw things. You did let's never do. What do you do? What?" And so that the joy, the love. The, the experience of, of that child in her arms, automatically all that pain and trauma went away. Uh, it didn't for me. Um, <laughs> it took me a little while to get over it. Um, didn't make sure we were coming home with Tanya, of course, but uh, yeah. So just really interesting because they're like, there are things in life. I made a long, I took a long lap to make this point, you guys. There are there are some things in life that we just go through all this fire, but when you when you get to the other side, the joy of it makes makes the pain of it seem so insignificant that you're willing to go through it again. Like let's do that again. Come on, like this is amazing. Look 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 what we just did. There's life in it, right? And so 
living a disciplined lifestyle is very much the same way. I'm not claiming that I understand what it's like to be pregnant or have a baby, ladies, because I'm I don't at all. But uh, I do know that like to get through like to get through the fire, to get to break through a wall, to do something that's uncomfortable and difficult and heart wrenching, like oh this what am I doing this for? And then you get to the other side and you're like oh my god this is this is what the fruit is so good and and that's just like um, living uh, a, a disciplined lifestyle. And so um, all that to say, guys, that. Uh, it's important that we put these things into practice and that we understand that they're, they're much, much bigger than, than maybe we've been uh, led to believe. Because some of you have been taught that chastity, for example, has only to do with sex and intimacy. And, and I think sometimes we, we just go to that, like, oh, that's what this discipline's all about. And for those of us who are no longer teenagers and we've got a, we've got a wife and, or a you know, husband for you ladies... Um, we're like, oh, I don't really have that problem anymore. Of course, that's foolish thinking. That's immature thinking, too. Like, oh, that just goes away and you get married. Um, but uh, actually, um, sex and intimacy is the, the least uh, attribute of, of chastity. And, and there, there's actually a call for us to live in total purity. And, and again, I'm not just talking about our, our physical bodies, but we spend so much time talking about that, so much time thinking about it. But Paul explains it very well in one of his letters to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, I think I have it up here. Yeah, in 1 Timothy 4.12 it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in the world in conduct and love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Alright, so in other words, we're supposed to be chaste in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity, which is the sex and intimacy thing. Right, but we spend so much time just talking about this last one. It's in there. It's, on, it's in the list. Don't get me wrong. Like Nobody's wrong for talking about it. And if it's the right thing to talk about for the particular audience that you're serving, then, then that's fine to zero in on that one thing. But I think we've done that for so long that we've, we tend to believe that that's all that this includes. And it, it does include it. I don't want to say that it doesn't, but we're supposed to be chased in all of these areas. All right, so I'm just going to literally scratch the surface here. To be chased in conduct means behaving righteously. It means doing the right thing even when no one's watching. It's how you treat the rental car. It's what you do with the cart at the grocery store when you're done using it. It's how you interact with that person who has nothing to offer you. Nothing to give your social status or to help you in any way. Okay, that's what it's like to be chaste in conduct. It means guarding what you say. It means choosing to avoid profanity and vile speech. Why? Because I want to be chaste in my conduct. To be chaste in love means that you keep your motives pure. Do you understand? You want to keep your motives pure. Not your th you want to do your best with your thoughts, but your thoughts are going to do what they do. And, and sometimes we have these wild or crazy or like, where did that thought come from? Or just nasty thoughts because, you know, for, come from you know, sin or imagination or wherever these thoughts come from. But it's our motives. We've got to keep our motives pure. It means you don't show preference to the fancy people of this world. You know who that guy is? That guy's got money. You know who this person is? He's got a this, or she's got a that, or they do this. And <clears throat> Let's show them preference. Let's put them in the front row. Let's give them... Look, I'm not saying that you don't be nice to those people. You be nice to everybody. Right. That's right. That's right? That's the point. That's, that's the point. We're just not showing preference to somebody just because they're, they're fancy. Right? Your love, to be chased in love means that, that your love needs to be filled with truth. You understand? When your love's not filled with truth, you end up in a really, really bad place. Right? It takes you down a very, very dark path. Oh, God just wants us to love and... How come we're not all getting along? And why aren't we all doing the same things together every weekend? And how come these two people don't really get... They need to be restored. Oh. 
So there has to be truth in love, always, right? And that's what it is to be chaste in love. Like, we, we, have, we do want to love and love extravagantly, but we also need to couple that love with the truth of God's word. Amen. To be chaste in spirit means that you carefully guard your ear, eye, mind, and heart gates. Okay. And only you can determine how you're going to guard those. But you need to guard those to be to be chaste in spirit. It means I, you know, there there are some things that I like to that I would like to watch that I don't watch because I want to protect. Okay my gates. I don't want to just let things flood through my gates. Matter of fact, if you guys have been through a 1090 where you gave up, I know like um, some of you have like done 1090s where you only watch uh, like nothing rated over G or PG or whatever. And then the 1090 ends, we hear this all the time. And the, you know, you go back and you watch a movie and it might be PG 13 or R or whatever. And you're like, dude, I couldn't even like just the stuff that was coming in. I couldn't even take it. And it's bizarre because we go years and years and years and we just take the stuff in. Like it's, Oh no, probably the shoot them up. Like, ah, 30 people just died. So like, cool. Hit the red button, you know, and like this built like, you spend some time away from that stuff, and then when you go back to it, you're much more sensitive to it. And all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, what is, what is all this stuff coming at me? And so to be chaste in spirit, that means we need to guard those gates. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Like your eye gates, your ear gates, the things that you hear, your heart gates, your, your mind gates, the things that you, you allow yourself to, to dwell on. You know, maybe you have a thought, and you're like, you know what? I probably shouldn't dwell on that thought. So you just start thinking other thoughts, right? That, that's what it means to be chaste in, in, in your spirit. And you regularly feed and nurture your spirit with the things that it needs for health and for growth. That's what it means to be chaste in spirit. To be chaste in faith means that you live what you profess. Put your money where your mouth is. You put the rubber on the road. I don't know whatever you want to say it, right? Like you live out your faith that you're unafraid to stand for what you believe and lovingly share your faith with others. Okay, so truth and love always together, never apart. All right, then finally, chaste in purity. This is the one that we famously have spent way, way too much time talking about, and maybe not too much, but um, it, it means that you don't treat what God has declared as special as something that is a common plaything. Right? It's special. Like, well, yeah, it feels good. Yeah, it's supposed to feel good. It's special. Right? And we need to treat that thing in a special way. It means that you avoid self-gratification. And instead, you pursue illumination. Is this making sense? All right. So God has a lot of wisdom to share about uh, sex and the sex drive. But the, the Bible isn't just limited to a carnal discipline. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time belaboring that point because there's tons and tons of resources out there for you. If you guys are, are struggling in, in that area to be, uh, to be pure, there's tons and gobs and gobs of help out there. And, and I would happily um, give you some recommendations. But spend the week thinking about what it's like uh, to, what it would be like to be chased in these other areas as, as well. Okay? Yeah. So to think that all you have to do to be, uh, to, to walk in the discipline of chastity is to just avoid physical temptations is really short-sighting what the word has to say about the topic. It really, it really does uh, kind of negate the larger truth about what it actually is um, to, to deal in the discipline of chastity. Okay, uh, is that fair enough to scratch the surface on that one? I told you guys to move quick. All right, let's talk about secrecy. Uh, there's little doubt that... Uh, any other discipline is, is, is not being challenged as much or to the degree <laughs> in which this discipline, the dis discipline of secrecy is. We have become a generation of oversharers. <laughs> you, you guys know that, right? We really have. We just, yeah, we just talking about everything. The more people talk about everything, the more I value my privacy, you know? And it's like... I don't know, I won't get into my pet peeves, but there's like these so-called influencers, social media giants, and hordes of wannabes. They just dream of hitting the follower jackpot. Oh, I just want the ja I just I just want the followers. Just racking up the followers. Followers equal money, and money is freedom, and that's mammon. And uh, we talk about you know, talk about it. 
And they'll go to all ends, guys. We, we'll go to every, every end, showing off their bodies, boasting about their skills and talents, bragging about how amazing they are, pranking and hurting the people who are close to them, telling you every intimate detail about their life and about the lives of those around them who probably don't want their very intimate details shared with you. And, and, and very little, if any, thought is given to this discipline of secrecy and the dignity that it, that it provides. And that's really what Christ did in, in uh, one major way, was to restore dignity to people. And the discipline of secrecy really does that as well. It really does uh, restore dignity to people. And the thing about talent is that if you've got it, you don't need to tell people that you have it. You guys get that, right? It's obvious. And, and people keep trying to make a way for their talent, which is very interesting. Isn't that the way of the world? Because the Bible says that it's your talent that will make a way for you. But see how we try to, we try to twist this thing. Just keep busy about the Father's business, and He will make sure that your talent is presented to the right people at the right time for His glory and for your victory. Trust him to do that. Just keep working on it, all right? The spiritual discipline of secrecy involves quietly and faithfully doing the work of God without informing others, without making it the, the headline, without shouting it from the rooftops, our, our good deeds and our gifts and our talents. And Jesus taught us not to use our good deeds to win the approval of people. And that's what so many do with their talents. Well, what should I do with all these talents? Or what should I do with my lovely looks? What should I do with all... Like, I'm just going to try to use them to, to win the hearts or the, or the approval of people. And Christ warns us not to do that. The Master himself often healed people and performed miracles and, and told the recipients of his grace not to tell other people. And I know there was like a bigger thing going on. Right? We understand that there was a, a bigger plan and purpose for Christ's life, but I think it's interesting that he would swear people to secrecy after, after doing these, these great miracles. And practicing the spiritual discipline of secrecy is one way, just one, it's one way of acknowledging that the best approval, the approval that really counts, comes from God rather than from other people. That's the gift of this discipline. It will help you to understand. It will help you to become less self-conscious and more God-conscious. Because you'll be focused on what He thinks about you and not what other people think about you. And secrecy, rightly placed, enables us to put our public relations department directly in the hands of God. All right, God, you handle this. I trust you to handle this. I trust you to do this for me. God's the one who lit our candles, right? That's what King David said. You light my candle so that I could jump over a wall or run through a troop. <laughs> you light my candle. And he lights our candles so that we could be the light of the world, not so that we could be hid under a bushel. We allow him to decide when our deeds will be known or when our light will be shown and who will be illuminated by it. Secrecy, at its best, teaches love and humility before God and before others. This is a really important practice for us, you guys. That love and humility that others see is that the best possible light, even to the point of our hoping that, that they would do better than us, that they would perform better than us, that they would that they would be recognized instead of us, that we would put others, that we would love somebody above ourselves. What would that be like? What would that be like? If the people on social media were like, hey, don't follow me, follow this guy. That's still not good, but you guys know what I'm saying. Right? Like we're putting somebody else before us. And the discipline of secrecy makes it possible what Paul was teaching us in Philippians... Oh, I do have it up there. Sweet. He said, 
Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. And let each esteem others better than himself. How do I do that? You do that through the discipline of secrecy. Seems weird, right? At first. But when you think about it, it doesn't actually seem that weird. Right? To live this way is to be free. To be truly free. Free from what? All of it. All of it. From caring so much about what everybody else thinks. Stacking up my followers and... I gotta create content. Somebody wants to see it. If you want to experience love in a greater way, the next time you're in a, a competitive situation, pray that the others around you would be more outstanding than you are. Try it. Pray that they would be more praised, that they would be more used of God than yourself. Honestly, pray for them. Pray for their success. See, most of the time, we want to know, we get jealous of their success, and we're like, well, how'd you do that? I want to know how to do that. If you did it, I want to, what did you apply? How did you, how'd you make that happen? Right, just pray for them. Pray for their success. Rejoice in their success. And it's only this discipline of secrecy that can lead you into an experience of, of bliss, of, of like a freedom, a joy, and a deep sense of happiness, like, like you never imagined pretty amazing. All right. Let me start to land this plane here, you guys. I want to talk to you guys about the, the discipline of sacrifice. And, and again, I would just say that I am making a very wide and broad stroke across all of these disciplines. And, and I, I'm doing that on purpose because A, I value your time. And B, I value your desire to seek out the Lord for yourself, to seek out truth, and to seek God out um, this week and have him teach you and show you. But let's talk about this, this last one here today. This is one we, we practice corporately at Strong Tower every year. Some of you guys already know. Uh, we, we do this together as a group, and we, and we should do it uh, uh, by ourselves as well, but the spiritual discipline of sacrifice is to willingly give up the security that we build for ourselves so that we can fully rely on God for what we need. Did you guys catch that? Okay, so it's, it's, it, isn't, it isn't just about giving something up. Okay, that's... That's short-sighting sacrifice like, like we've been short-sighting chastity. Yeah. It's not just about giving something up. Right? We, we have to look inside ourselves. We have to understand why we're sacrificing something in the first place. Why, why, would, I even, why would I even be doing this? Sacrifice doesn't mean denying yourself something that you want. That's the discipline of frugality, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. So it's important that you understand what disciplines you're applying to yourself and how to apply them on purpose, right? When I do push-ups, I'm not going, oh, look at all these sit-ups I'm doing. <laughs> you're like, well, you're still doing exercise. Yes, that's true. But they're different, right? Yeah. Very different. Okay, same here. Those, those, are, those are also very different, right? Sacrifice means giving up what we already have in order to please God. Sacrifice means giving up what you already have in order to please God. Sacrifice means taking ourselves outside of our comfort zones. Taking ourselves outside of ourselves and learning to rely on God in all cases for the things that we need. And this is the very framework for the discipline of engagement. So all the, there's a reason why I did these guys first, right? And why I wanted to talk with you guys about this one last. This, this sets the framework. Sacrifice sets the framework for all the disciplines of engagement, which we're going to learn about on the backside of this series, right which starts next week. Okay? So it's going to be one that very important for you guys to practice and to understand how to, how to implement in your life if you want to be successful at the disciplines that are to come, the disciplines of engagement, the ones that we do, that we're active about, which are a little more fun, too. So sometimes God asks, asks us to sacrifice something important. Doesn't he? Yes. Okay. Think about Abraham, right? <laughs> 
Sometimes God will ask us to sacrifice something important to us in order for us to learn that there is something greater beyond it. <clears throat> I think I have some scriptures for you to consider here. Other times we need to practice the spiritual discipline of sacrifice that we can learn to rely on God's provisions rather than the things that we can provide for ourselves. If God supplies you with chicken, you eat the chicken. <laughs> right? You guys know what I'm talking about as a nod to one of our previous messages, so go back and, and listen to that. But we, this, this discipline teaches us not to rely on, on our own resources, the things that I can do, the power that I have to create the life that I wanted to. Look, I'm a self-made man. I did all these things. I started this business. I made this money, and I put these things together. I networked with these people, and me, 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 me. When it's really not about you at all, it's, it's him. Amen? It's him. It's always about Him. And we can't rely on our own resources. We need to rely fully on God. It's, it's part of submitting to God. Sacrifice, sometimes, is just about keeping things simple. Sometimes we've just made things too complicated. And we've got to simplify. We've got to cut some stuff out of our lives. Right? For many of us, sacrifice may mean giving up a relationship. Or a preference. It's probably for my married couples. <laughs> or an activity. Or our time. Probably the hardest thing, right? Hmm. By sacrificing, we lose a sense of security in ourselves and develop a sense of security in God. And the real key, if you want me to be totally honest, about sacrifice is... The revelation, not the knowledge, right? Not the knowledge, but the revelation that everything in this life is His. Including my time. Wow. Well, you mean give up my time? I have this to do. You don't know how busy I am. I have these things. Wow, you on the throne. Check you out. Look at you. Just straighten up that crown. Looks good on you, said no one. <laughs> everything in this life, everything, it all belongs to him. It all belongs to him. It's all his. God does not ask us to sacrifice at the expense of others. Hello? Nor is he pleased by our irresponsibility in that end. Understand? Using God as an excuse to get out of things is not pleasing to Him. Like everything that God places in our hands, the spiritual discipline of sacrifice must be handled responsibly if we're going to do it right. All right. Here are some really simple ways to practice this discipline. I'm going to close with this. First, realize that everything, including us, including our time, all that stuff, it all belongs to God. It's much easier to sacrifice when we have a proper perspective of that which we claim to possess. Understanding that it's all His. All right, so first we want to consider the source. God should be your sole source of security. You understand? He's a jealous God, and anything you put before Him is an idol, and He's going to deal with that. You know, especially if you say you're a believer, especially if you're chasing after him, especially if you're like, oh, God, shape me, create in me a clean heart, oh, Lord. And you say these, all these beautiful prayers. You better be ready. You better be ready. Because the Holy Spirit's like, okay, I've come for your words. Yeah. I come for God's words. Yeah. You bet I do. When I'm asking for healing or if I, if I need some type of provision, I come for his words. Yep. And I don't approach him like a sniveling bratty child. I'm, I'm not like God, uh, waving my bony little finger at God. But I do say, God, this is what you said. I didn't say this. I didn't choose to say this. This is what you said to me about my life. 
And I am here because I have come for your words. We need to reconcile because my life doesn't look like what you said. And I know that you're not a liar. I'm not accusing you. I'm not up here telling you what to do. I'm not saying that, that I'm trying to be the boss of things and boss you around. But I am saying that this is what you said. What are you going to do about what you said? You said this. And I believe it. I represent him with his word. Yeah. And fair turns fair play. That's why your yes should mean yes and your no should mean no. And if you make a promise, you better keep it. And if you pray a, a prayer that you don't understand, like God give me patience, buckle up. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit will come for your words. I have come for your words. Right? So God is our sense of security. we got to find security in Him and no other thing. Okay? That's a great place to start sacrificing. Understanding that everything belongs to God. Uh, also, go deeper than the surface. It's likely that you're not going to be called to give away all your possessions. Everybody take a big sigh of relief. I'm not saying that you won't be, but it's, it's likely that you're not gonna, God's not going to ask you to do that. Okay? But Jesus also taught us to give up our expectations, our desire, our ideas of what success looks like, even our prejudices. God might be asking you to sacrifice your worldview. He might be asking you to sacrifice sacrifice your political ideologies. He might be asking you to sacrifice your desires, and he will be asking you to sacrifice your idols. I can assure you of that. All right, so remember that God is an all-in God. He's all in. What does it mean to be all in? Well, in a bacon and egg breakfast, what's the difference between the chicken and the pig? The chicken's involved, right? But the pig's all in. The pig's committed, right? And that's how we want to be, guys. In our Christianity, we, we don't want to just be participants. We want to be all in. We want to get all in on this. All right? And God is an all in God. And we get nervous about sacrificing our time or our treasures or our relationships. We need to remember that God made the ultimate sacrifice for us. And we are called to be just like him. Lastly, evaluate the inner man. All right? The discipline of sacrifice strikes at the very heart of our sin struggle, which is selfishness. You're so selfish. Are you living simply? Are you creating space to serve? Are you giving God uh, like room to, to move in your life? Or are you just, you filled up so much time and... I mean, if you're giving him this hour, that's awesome. And, and I'm, I don't mean that uh, condescendingly. I think it's awesome. God thinks it's awesome that we would give him our, our time. Time is ours to steward, right? But if this is it, if this is all you're getting, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I, I try to be a good pastor to you guys, but it's not enough. It's just not enough. You need to be seeking God every day. Every day. Okay? This, this can't be enough, right? So at, at face value, the disciplined life, you know, you start talking about what it is to live a disciplined life. It doesn't really sound all that appealing, <laughs> to be honest. Like, live a disciplined life? Like, there's no rules. <laughs> I'd rather live that life. You know what I mean? <laughs> Put your shirt on. <laughs> there's one rule. <laughs> But listen, if you, if, you start, if you start to put these disciplines into practice in a, in a simple and strategic and systematic way, you will discover the blessings and, and the richness, the, the satisfaction that comes along with, with godly living. It's not just about showing up at church and doing good things and being a good Christian and bringing my tithe and like all the all the things we ascribe to what it is to be, to be good God, God Jesus didn't die on the cross for us just to have like to be good he sacrificed his life so that we could be his children so we could be engrafted into the family to live lives that are so much bigger than we are and, and, and that's really what a, a disciplined life is it's an invitation to higher levels of living, to greater experiences of joy and struggle and wrestling and working out your salvation and working out your Christianity together with the Holy Spirit. It's awesome. I believe that the disciplined life in Christ is the only pathway and the clearest pathway 
to victorious living. And I hope that you guys are finding that too. Amen? Yes. God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we, uh, as we stand with the rock, let's not just be inactive. Father, help us that we're not just inactive. Rub against us, Father, that we would be sharpened, that we would be sharpened by it. We thank you, Father, for these disciplines. Help us to, um, to seed them in our lives. Help us to live in them, Father, that it would be like clothes, that it would be like a second skin, Lord, that we would not just have these to hold, but we would take them to live, Lord. Help us as we are shaped to make these part of our everyday lives, God, that we would be at the ready at all times to be used of you, to exalt you, to glorify your name, to encourage others, to be the beacon of hope, Lord, that somebody runs to because Christ in us is the hope of glory. So help us to be those beacons of Jesus, that when somebody would run to us, we would point to him and say, let's go there together. Let's live this together. And together with Christ, he will be victorious in our life. So thank you, Father, as we continue to uh, push forward and push through. Thank you that you have given us the battle plan and the how-to in these disciplines so that, Lord, the victorious life would be um, an attraction for others to want to live it and then expand your kingdom. That's what it's all for, Lord, bringing your kids home. So we thank you for that. Use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can all be dismissed. Go on ahead downstairs and grab some food if you like. We love you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>